Hi, my name is Simon Powers, and this is a video for classicalguitarcorner.com. In this video, I'm going to walk you through the repertoire workbook for Targa's Lagrima. The repertoire workbook series takes individual pieces and walks you through step by step through the musicality, the analysis of the piece and the theory, and also the technical aspects of playing the piece. In essence, it's like having a lesson with me here in New York City. You can get the repertoire workbook at classicalguitarcorner.com and then follow along with this video. The piece itself is a miniature masterpiece and a real gem of the classical guitar repertoire. It's only 16 measures long, but within that 16 measures we have a world of nostalgia, delicacy, beautiful phrasing and structure, and some interesting harmonic movement as well. The piece is called Lagrima, and take note that there's a little accent over the A, so you have to push that letter instead of saying Lagrima, which a lot of people say in English, uh, you say Lagrima. The same with the composer's name, Targa, which has an accent over it as well. Now the word means tear or teardrop in Spanish. So that should inform just a little bit how you play this piece. It's quite delicate and there might be a, a, an element of sadness or nostalgia. Now the story goes that Targa was in London when he composed this piece and he was pining for his homeland of Spain. So that adds even more nostalgia to this piece. So those two things, the name and the story behind its composition might inform how you play this piece. Very beautiful, nostalgic and delicate. So now I'll perform for you the first 16 measures of the piece. No repeats, just so you can hear the material that we're going to work with. Okay, so we start out in the repertoire workbook with keys and form. Now, the keys in this piece are called parallel keys. So there's E major and E minor. They're not relative, that would be uh, G major and E minor or E major and C sharp minor. Those are relative minors. But uh, these are parallel keys. So we have a key with the same root note or tonic, but with a different mode. So we have E major and E minor. Those are the two keys we work with. The first eight measures of the piece are in E major and the second eight measures are in E minor and they both have repeats. And by the end you go to a dal capo, which means to the head or to the beginning. And you play again to it says fine, which means finished. So this creates a ternary form, which means three parts. It goes A, that's the E major section, which repeats, then B, the E minor section, which repeats, then back to A. And usually you don't repeat the last A section in the ternary form. So we have A, B, A. Now to help practice the key centers and also some of the fingering that we come across in the piece, I provided two different three octave scales, an E major three octave scale and an E harmonic minor three octave scale. The big difference between them is I've chosen different ways to get up to that 12th fret, that high E. The first one, the E major scale, uses shifting uh, in the fingerboard, sliding up the strings, and the second E harmonic minor uses shifting that takes advantage of open strings, the open E string, so that you can shift while you're playing the open string and keep going up, which is what we use in the piece. So I think it will be useful for you to practice these two scales to practice the method of shifting that comes up in the piece. So here's the first E major scale. harmonic minor scale. So they both have different ways of shifting up to that 12th fret and we're going to come across that shifting technique in the piece itself. Okay, the melody. Now this is something I really insist on my students doing in lessons and if you 
are a student of mine, you'll know very, very well that I ask this all the time with many different pieces, and that is to play the melody through by itself. I think it's incredibly useful to have it in your ear, a very solid idea of what the melody sounds like, that will help you play it throughout the piece. If you don't understand exactly what the melody is, then how are you supposed to play it out? How are you supposed to bring it out when you perform the piece? The classical guitar has a lot of information crammed into one stave. Maybe in another world, in the perfect world, you'd have guitar music on a grand stave like the piano, because there'd be more space to see what's going on with the voices. But we have it all crushed in there on the treble clef, and uh, we have to make do with all the stems flying everywhere. So I think it's really important when you start a piece just to get the melody really strong and solid inside your ear so you can understand what's meant to be brought out during the piece. So I'm gonna play a simplified version of the melody in the piece and I'll talk a little bit about it after that. So that melody isn't exactly what you find in the music, but there are some cases where the melody is set off by an eighth note, it sort of put off the beat, or there might be some inner voices that are confusing the melody itself. So I've simplified it a little bit. For instance, measure 11 sounds like this. So in a simplified form, we could just simply say the melody is like this. That way we have a stronger idea of what the melody is and we can know what notes to bring out. The second little confusing measure is this. Now the melody here is quite confusing because we have an inner voice that comes up that sounds like the melody because there's nothing else happening on the third beat. The third beat is empty and then there's a final E. So it's really up to you to decide what the melody is here, but if you played it without all the other notes, you might hear... I don't know if that makes too much sense. I think it might be more... like that. It's up for you to decide, but you do need to make a decision, and that will inform how you actually play the melody in the piece. So go through the melody several times so you really know what it is. Don't worry about the left hand fingering. You can make up whatever fingering you like. You may have noticed I did very different fingerings when I just played it. The main thing is to hear it. You can sing it and you can play it over and over again and really just understand exactly what the melody is. Okay, now the next thing I wrote on that page is the bass line. The bass is equally important to understand. So let's go through it right now. So that's the 16 measures of bass line. Now this isn't as melodious as the melody, clearly, but it is still a line unto itself. You could sing it, it's almost like singing an inner part or a bass part in a choir. So you should be able to know that whole bass line as well as the melody. That's going to inform how you bring it out and how you play it in the piece. Now this section is very important and I think it's one of the harder things for intermediate level musicians to understand, but it really is the key to playing at a higher level. And that is to differentiate the voicing in a piece. Uh, I've titled this section, I Hear Voices, uh, and I think you really need to uh, understand in any given piece that you play, how voicing works on the guitar. It is one of the more difficult things we do because we have one hand and a bunch of fingers, but we have to make different a different hierarchy of voices throughout any given piece that has a structure to it. So the melody sits nice on top and nice and loud. The bass is powerful too, supporting everything. And the middle voice is often much softer and they're in an accompaniment role. It shouldn't stand out. So what I've done is that I've marked all of the accompaniment notes. Well, not so much the accompaniment notes. I've marked the notes that you need to make sure you play nice and softly in orange. These notes normally 
just because they're on an open string or they're easy to play, they might be played very loudly. But let me see if something sounds familiar to you. Those Bs shouldn't be sticking out at all. They should be very soft and they're just a very low supporting sound like this. So they're there and they are supporting the rest of the melody and the bass, but they're quite soft. I mean, it's a repeated note after all, so you don't need to bang us over the head with that repeated note. So be very careful to play all of those notes marked in orange as a separate voice, which is generally softer or at least a different tone color than the other notes. The second thing I talk about is the danger notes, a very dramatic term for mostly open strings. So in this piece, we have some really beautiful lush notes that are in the higher positions and some on the second and third string. Really beautiful, that's the stuff we love on the guitar. Then we have measure seven and eight, for example, where we have two danger notes. These are two open E strings that pop in out of nowhere after all these beautiful notes. And if you don't take care of them, they can kind of sound like this. They can be much brighter and more brittle than the other notes. So you need to make sure you match the sound of those notes. And in the case of the E in measure seven, it's an accompaniment note. So you need to play that even softer. So we take care of those red notes, take care of the danger notes. <laughs> On page five, we start talking about harmony and I give a harmonic analysis of the piece. And the reason this is important is because it gives yet another way for you to understand how the piece is structured together. Now, you may think, or someone else may think that, why should I need to know what the harmony is doing? I can just play the piece. Can't we just play the piece and play it with good technique, then it'll be okay. Well. I like to use the analogy of knowing a person. If you know a person from school or from work and you see them all the time in that setting, you know the person from one perspective in one dimension. And that's fine, you know the person, but maybe you don't know them that well. Let's say then you go out with that person to a party or in a group event. Then you've seen that person in a social setting and you'll uh, be in contact with another way. Then let's say you went out on a bike ride together and you crashed your bike and they took you to hospital and they took care of you, then you really know that person and you've spent quality time with them and so you think of them quite differently and you treat them differently as well. This is a long way to say it's important to know pieces from different angles too. So look at the harmony, see how things repeat, see how simple things are, one and five and the relationship there, and then that should inform how you approach this piece. It's really worth your time, put down the guitar, sit down with a harmonic analysis and just listen to it and that's gonna help you a lot. So now we're gonna talk about the technique of the piece and we're gonna start with guide fingers. Guide fingers are very common in this piece and it's gonna help you play legato and it's gonna help steady your left hand. So it's important to find out where those guide fingers are and also how to make the most of them in terms of playing. So the very first and most obvious one is right at the beginning. That guide finger there is the fourth finger. It's gonna stay in contact with the first string, the G sharp, A, B, and then back down to the F sharp. And that gives a lot of connectivity between those notes. It's gonna play legato, more legato than if you were to detach or use different fingers. So make sure you take advantage of that guide finger. Now there are other examples I've given of guide fingers here in the piece, but I think the most important one is when you come up to the 12th fret here. That guide finger there, the fourth finger, is gonna keep your hand steady as you maneuver around those tricky bares, which we're gonna talk about in a second. Now one instance where I don't really want you to use a guide finger is at the beginning with those bases. That second finger there easily could slide up the string like a guide finger would. But because of the bass string, I want to get rid of that squeak if I can. So that second finger is going to lift, still use that fourth finger as a guide finger, and then play the G sharp on the sixth fret. When it comes to bares, this is probably one of the more difficult techniques for people to master. So stay with it and be patient. Now, 
a couple of things that I notice people do to hinder themselves is they often put down the bar A on more strings than they need to. So let's say this bar A here, you're going to need that bar A over four strings, not the five that I currently have it on. So make sure you only use it on the ones that you need. That's going to save you a bit of energy and uh, keep your left hand as relaxed as it can be. The other thing is to make sure you roll the bar A just a tiny bit on the side. It's not flat on the, the, the direct underside of your finger and keep the joint here straight. If you're trying to do the barre with a, a joint that's come down, that isn't straight across the finger, that's gonna cause you a lot of trouble. So keep that joint, that finger there straight. Keep this top knuckle up and make the finger a straight barre across. There are a couple of places in this piece where you can prepare your barre after an open string. And one of the first examples I give is in measure nine. So we've come from the C, B, open E, and then we can prepare our barre. So, so use that E as a nice time to shift down. Don't make any quick jerky movements. Relax that barre and there are other instances as well. Now talking of left hand preparation this is a technique that I think really creates a lot of legato sounds on the guitar and that is really important to instill into your left hand a sense of preparation with the left hand fingers. We often talk about it with the right hand but the left hand can do it as well so a simple example might be we're gonna play E, F sharp and G sharp and when we play the F sharp, I don't want your third finger to be all the way over here. I want it to be hovering over the G sharp because that's where it's going to play. So that gives you a bit more control and accuracy with the left hand. So let's see where that applies in Lagrima. Now I've marked all of the places in Lagrima where you can prepare your left hand in purple. And my favorite place is measure 9, 10, 11. So we're going to have a look at measure 11 right now. It's a really fun series of stretches and each time you need to prepare your left hand. You can't just jump quickly between the notes. That's going to cause a jerky kind of uh, hurried sound. What you need to do is play the top E, then stretch with that first finger, get it ready before you play the note, then prepare the second finger, prepare the third finger, prepare the fourth finger, and prepare the bari. <laughs> it's a really I think it's quite a fun little passage to play, but obviously it's a little tricky with all those stretches, but practice it in isolation. And that way you can really hear that melody like we talked about. And it's nice and clear and it rings over to the next notes. Make sure to prepare all of the left hand fingers when they can be. It's gonna make your hand move a lot more smoothly. On page nine, we get to alternate fingerings. And here I provided some different ways in the left hand to finger different passages. Either musical challenges are overcome or technical challenges. So let's look at the first one. This actually gets around the tricky bares that come along up at the ninth position. So here's what we normally play. And that has bares that get shifted all the way through that material. But we can actually play all of that without the barre. So that might actually be something that's useful for you if you find those bars particularly difficult. It offers a different sound a little bit in the left hand, a different sound with the shifting. Uh, so it really is up to you whether you decide on one fingering or another. But we all have different hands, so I think it's important to look for different solutions and alternatives for different people. There's also a great use of campanella fingering that I put in the fingering of this piece. And campanella means bells in Italian. And it's the idea that instead of playing uh, a passage uh, all on one string, you actually play them on different strings. So you get this a bell-like technique. And it can be very effective in, well, it, it's a nice coloration that you can add to your piece with left hand fingering. The fingering here comes up in measure six. So we have a nice ringing over of the different notes to create a harmony. And this is something you can add in or you can change the fingering to be more melodic. 
Finally, we come to phrasing and expression. Now, in this piece, we have sentential structure, which I go over in some other lessons on the site. But basically, we have two large eight bar phrases. And within those, we have a small phrase, a small phrase, and a bigger phrase, two, two, and four. So the first two, followed by the second, And then the long four bar phrase. So two, two and four. And it's important to mark in this phrasing in the music as I've done in the repertoire workbook so that you can understand how it should flow. If you're ever going to have any written uto or rallentando, you need to put it towards the end of that long phrase. That's going to be a more natural place to do it. If you put it in the middle, let's say, You're going to break up the flow of the music. Maybe that's a bit of an exaggerated example, but you need to put it towards the ends of the phrases. That's why you need to mark the phrases in. The second half has a very similar sentential structure, but the material's a little different. So that's the first two measure phrase. And then that's another phrase and the four measure phrase. So I've marked in the written uter there towards the end of that longer part of the phrase. And that's where it makes most sense to me. Now there are plenty of places here for expressive possibilities. So we have the glissando. Now I implore you not to make this kind of comical. Not too much of a portamento with all the notes in it. I want you to just to increase, if you can, this is kind of an advanced technique, but increase the pressure of your left hand finger as it approaches that C. That way you're going to start hearing the crescendo into that C with the left hand, actually. It's a really nice technique. It, it kind of swells into that next note. Instead of going, which is almost like a trombone slide. It's a little bit silly. <laughs> and the other place where you can really add some expression is using dynamics. Now we've got repeated phrases here, like in the first sentential phrase, that first iteration then it repeats so why not do something like change to tasto and play piano then you can return back to your previous tone and add in that risenuto that we found at the end of the phrase so read those ideas on phrasing and expression and experiment with what you come up with with the piece this is, for me, the most exciting and fun part of learning a piece where you get to experiment and try your own ideas. It's where you really start working alongside the composer to make the music your own. I hope you found that useful. And if you don't have the book, please consider purchasing it at classicalguitarcorner.com. My name is Simon Powers, and thanks for watching this video.